that we will read the narrative of the passion and the death of Jesus. <clears throat> it is, uh, in some ways, the, the spirit of this part of the gospel uh, conveys itself very aptly, I think. It's a, there's a little change in tone, in fact. This happens in all the gospels, in fact, towards the end, where they're taking note of the events and the particulars of, of those uh, moments, both leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, his condemnation, and also uh, the latter events of his resurrection. It's, it's like a if they get very narrative, in other words, and they include very concrete, sometimes it's sort of, we don't know exactly what it means, perhaps, our first read. For instance, the young man in the garden with the linen that falls off and he runs away naked. I mean, what does this mean? Right, but there are little details there that were caught and remembered forever. So I want to suggest to you something. This will be a brief, very brief reflection. Firstly, to remember that Palm Sunday is the great portal, the, the door that opens up a sacred time for Christians everywhere. Now there are graces on loan to the world in a special way, given to the world, evangelistically even, being proclaimed to those who are not yet baptized, but yet are in the catechumenate. They are members of the elect. And even now, faith grows in their hearts, even as they await baptism, which is the source and, and foundation for the life of grace. So we begin a week that is holy and sacred, in that we do ourselves, our families, our children, and thinking about our connection to Christians throughout the world we don't even know, and yet are bound to them by bonds closer even than love. We do well to observe the reverence due to this season. To attend to scripture, the stories, what the church has to propose for us, what the word of God itself says to us. Start having a prayer time if you're not already doing that, for instance. M many things that you can do to simply say, Lord, I love you. And now, in a special way, I commit myself to a communion that is the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, the people of God. We are your disciples. These little details I was mentioning include a certain man named Simon Cyrene, or Simon from Cyrenia. It says that he was a passerby, as Mark characterizes him. There's some other descriptions given to us by St. Matthew, but in the long run, he's someone who is there out of curiosity, it seems like. That's what we got, gather a sense of that. He was pressed into service by the centurions who were accompanying Jesus on the way of the cross. He was not given an option. One gives, gets that impression, huh? And yet, we remember Simon every time we read this part of the gospel, we remember his name and his place in the order of uh, the, uh, the saints even. In fact, we, we know something about his ladder after this occurred, but to point out something, he did not expect to have this pressed on him. And one imagines that not only was this embarrassing, but it was a very difficult thing to do. He was being bullied by an occupying force, right, that had corrupt, by the way, this corruption of the status quo, the, the, uh, the elite of the Jewish people themselves were kind of in this terrible collaboration with Pilate. I mean, where is, the, where is Herod and the king, right? This is, we're talking Pilate right now, who is the representative of Caesar, a pagan. And so Simon is a Jew, though, nonetheless, and he's in this embarrassing position of having to go out into the street with the man who's been condemned to blasphemy, has been sentenced and is on his way to the cross because he needs help, right? I just want to suggest to you, perhaps, to think about the following question, which is a crucial one, one that's sort of, in some sense, the tradition cries out to us to consider it. What are your expectations of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth in your life? What do you expect of the Lord? Who is he to you? Because you'll note that the people that awaited him in Jerusalem and finally welcomed him certainly had a strong idea 
about who they wanted him to be. Because after they greeted him, adulating his presence, his entrance, and Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in there, palms being strewn out before him as he passed through the main gate and into the city. No sooner than they had done that than three days later, they were disappointed, let down, crucify him, crucify him. You know, this is an amazing thing happening here. I want to suggest to you then to reconsider who Jesus is to you, what your expectations of him are. And more than this, if you are pressed into service, what your life as a Christian will entail, by the way, suffering and burdens that we all know we all have, how those indeed constitute something that we call the cross of Christ. Friends that you know who suffer beyond telling, sometimes silently and without friends to console them, that they need help bearing their cross, that yours is a choice, in fact. You're not compelled by Roman centurion servants along the way with swords, but you are commanded to love as Christ loves and to see that his throne as the king of the universe, not just of Israel, the king and and creator of the universe, his throne was not festooned with grandeur or sceptered power. His throne at the end was the cross. And that is the focus of this liturgy.